all your years of paying tax, you still All your years of paying tax, you still wonder, why does it matter? It is true that we are facing a great emergency. It matters now more than ever. It matters to those who are exposed to harm to keep us away from it. The ones that leave behind all that they love. Your tax matters to them. Those who spend endless hours standing on their feet to care for others. It matters to those who are always at the heart of any crisis and our future generations. It matters to those who put so much love into giving selflessly to each and every family living on the breadline. It matters to all of us. To all taxpayers, pay your fair share. Do it for your nation. Your tax matters. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, our colleagues on, um, um, that are joining us from various places all over South Africa. Good evening to our um, ex-co members that are on the platform. Good evening to our tax practitioners. Uh, good evening to trustees that have joined us this evening. Um, good evening to all the taxpayers and all people from all walks of life that have joined us tonight. My name is Matimba Machavele. I'm going to be your program director for the, for the night. And um, we will start um, by just a little bit reflecting on the video that just has played right now. You will realize that uh, that um, video means to us that we are responsible, South African, responsible for our text. So therefore, our tax matters. Our tax matters. Hashtag our tax matters. You might have heard our commissioner speaking in various forms. He tell us these our tax matters. So good evening, everybody, and welcome. And I would want to take this opportunity to thank our commissioner, who is the leader of the SARS as an organization, leader of us as employees. And thank you very much for your leadership that you are providing to us. Thank you, our EXCO and our EXPO members that are on the platform and um, greetings to all our, 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 our staff. And thank you for the support that you are giving us. And tonight we are going to have a jump pack program uh, that we are going to deal with trust and the trust issues. I hope by the end of this session, by the end of this webinar, you are going to be well enlightened about the issues of trust, the trust of uh, the obligation as a trustee, as a practitioner, as a taxpayer, you know, because this is an opportunity that we are providing to our public to engage with us. So just quickly before we even start there, I just want to reiterate something which comes from our, our SARS strategy that says that the strategy number one says that is for SARS to provide the clarity and certainty of tax obligation. And I think this webinar today, it's about exactly that. We want to make it easy for taxpayers to comply. And tonight, it's exactly that. So therefore, allow me to just to highlight a little bit of our, of our program tonight. We are going to have our keynote speaker, who's going to speak about trust, about science, about the organization and, uh, and uh, the way forward. And after that, we're going to have our presenters that are going to present to us the trust and the trust filing and the changes that are coming in that we have and some of the things that you need to take note as a tax practitioner, as a trustee, as a member, as a beneficiary of a trust. And then finally, we're going to have our Q&A uh, question um, where we're going to allow you to ask us questions um, immediately after the, 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 the presentation. So in a high level, those are the four items that we are going to have tonight. So as we start our session tonight, um, I am going um, to invite our guest speaker. So our 
item that is following right now is that we are going to have our keynote speaker who is going to speak to us about trust, about trust, about the organization. And he is not a man who is not known. His name is Mark Kinnon. He is currently the head of the stakeholder engagement and he has been with SARS for the last 37 years. More recently, he was an active commissioner in 2018 for 14 months. He has held role, strategic roles in the organization, including legal interpretation, enforcement, business systems, and operational support. Above all, he is a highly regarded, he's a highly regarded tax executive who was involved with the subcommittee of Cuts Commission responsible for the nonprofit sector. So I will take this opportunity to welcome Mark. Mark, please give us the keynote for tonight. Good evening and thank you, Matimba. Um, I just, we can't seem to start the video. I don't know if the host uh, can do that. I think there we go. Well, thank you, Matimba, and uh, thank you for everybody who is uh, on the, the webinar this, this evening. We no doubt have trustees, we've got practitioners and other trust administrators, and of course, my colleagues in SARS, including the commissioner, who are joining us this evening. Thank you for joining, and we look forward to a good evening, an engaging evening, where not only yourselves learn, but also us um, as SARS employees. Thank you for taking out uh, to allow us to, to empower you regarding the important aspects of, of trusts and how they are treated for tax purposes. I thought it would be good at the outset just to reflect on a very brief history of trusts. And I don't think many people know this. And I need to uh, acknowledge that I consulted Dr. Google uh, in, in this regard. Most historians agree that the roots of trusts came from medieval England when the knights went to war and the properties uh, were left uh, in the ownership of somebody who would be a trust in what we know today. However, very interestingly, the concept of a trust is even older and was already present in Roman and Greek law. The Romans used the word fiducia, which we also use today. The adoption of trust law in ancient Rome resulted in cases where wealthy Romans entrusted their friends to manage their property in favor of their wife and heirs after their death. Because under Roman law, unless the wife was a Roman citizen, she could not inherit by herself. Very interestingly, we had a lot of dishonesty even then. And former friends broke the promise due to the absence of relevant legislation to control those trusts. But let's turn to, to uh, South Africa and the South African environment. I think we all know that trusts are governed by the Trust Control Act, Property Control Act, and a trust's constitutional document. In other words, the trust founding document is the trust deed, or in the case of uh, estates where a trust is established, the will is, is often the, the constituting document. And this sets out the framework in terms of which the trust must operate. You're obviously aware that trust must be registered with the master of the high court uh, in the relevant jurisdiction, in other words, regionally, where the trust's assets are situated. Trustees may only act once the, once the master has issued le letters of authority. Interestingly enough, a trust does not have a legal personality. However, for tax, which we're talking about tonight, it is regarded to be a separate legal entity. So the question tonight is why the importance of trusts in the context of SARS? In this regard, I wanted to link what we are doing on trusts to our SARS strategic objectives, which I'm sure you already know. We have nine strategic objectives, and I thought I would just touch on a few of them tonight and linking it to the engagement on trusts, which we have uh, on the table tonight. An important aspect for SARS is that we provide clarity and certainty for taxpayers. And Matimba has already mentioned this. And in this case, obviously, clarity and certainty to trustees. That is why the commissioner has initiated these webinars in an effort to provide greater clarity to the taxpayer fraternity. 
If there is absolute clarity, there can be little uh, excuse for not making a correct uh, declaration to SARS. And that's our intent to provide clarity to you. And it's not only going to be these webinars. We're talking of guides, we're talking of clarity notes, interpretation notes, and many other documents which we will try and release over time, our website, etc. Secondly, and very importantly, we intend to make it easy for taxpayers and traders to comply with their obligations. For trusts, I think this is very relevant as the registration of tax for tax of trusts is very problematic as already been indicated with many challenges existing in the registration of trusts. We aiming that we will automate this in due course with in interfaces, for instance, to the master of the high court. Many of you know how we deal with companies today when you register at the CIPC, uh, you automatically get a tax number assigned. Why can't we do the same for trusts? And part of our vision is that we would do so. Thirdly, the third objective is for taxpayers and traders who do not comply, and in this case, the trusts that do not comply, we intend to make non-compliance both hard and costly. Many trusts are not complying with their obligations, whether it be of registration, whether it be of the submission of tax returns, or the payment of the taxes that are ultimately due. We aim firstly to encourage voluntary compliance, and I would remind you of the voluntary uh, compliance program that we do have. However, when people do not make use of our services and do not do the right thing insofar as trust, be assured we will get to a point where we will identify those who are not complying and we will use every aspect available for us to enforce the law. Uh, our journey is to collect the taxes that are due to the FISC. Our fourth strategic objective is to develop a high performing, diverse and agile, engaged and evolved workforce. Various steps have been announced by the commission in this regard. But as we deal with trusts, we need the expertise to understand the intricacies of trusts and how the tax obligations are determined. It is our intention to both recruit people with the necessary expertise and train our staff uh, to have the expertise to deal, whether it be in the audit or whether it be in the advice that is provided in the service centers, in whatever form that our staff are empowered to deal properly with trusts. Fifth objective, it is SARS's intention to expand the use of data within a comprehensive knowledge management framework to ensure integrity, derive insight, and improve outcomes. For trust, this would include interfaces with external parties. I indicated, for instance, the master of the high court, but I can talk of financial institutions and any other entities. But also very importantly, where income flows through a trust, we need to ensure that all this data is available to ensure the person who is the ultimate beneficiary actually pays the tax that is due. And this can be done through proper use of data. Our sixth strategic, strategic objective that we have and stated that we'll modernize our systems to provide both uh, digital and streamlined online services. This applies equally to trusts, and I'm sure many aspects of our online services can be improved in this regard. Already on the chat, uh, the Q&A session, uh, the Q&A that is part of, uh, of the discussion today, I've seen comments where there can be improvements. For instance, the one example cited already was the changing of bank details. I'm gonna jump through to our eighth strategic objective, which relates to our stakeholders. We are working with and through stakeholders to improve the tax ecosystem. In this regard, we are working with the master of, of the High Court and the Department of Justice. In addition, as we develop our vision for trusts and Matimba and a number of others are working on that, we'll work with the tax practitioner stakeholders and others who are responsible for the administration of trusts, that we can make a system that works both in ensuring proper compliance, but that it is easy on the other side. The last strategic objective that I want to focus on is uh, number nine. And what we want to strive to do here 
is to build public trust and confidence in the tax admin system. And all that we do is aimed in that direction. Ladies and gentlemen, trusts are an important aspect of both our journey to become a smart and modern SaaS that acts with unquestionable integrity and that is trusted and admired. Join us tonight in ensuring compliance in this important area. Enjoy this evening and I trust it helps you in improving your understanding in respect of trusts. I want to thank the panelists and thank you and back to you, Matimba. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, Mark, for that keynote speak, um, keynote address. Um, as he has indicated from where the trust started from. And I can also say that uh, one of the things that I also consulted was Dr. Google and also some of the research articles that uh, are available. The indication is that um, in the past, um, especially South Africa, uh, trust were mainly used for, uh, uh, for, for tax purposes, for tax planning. But more and more now we are seeing more people moving into a space of trust where they are using trust to preserve their assets, to protect their assets, to pro protect their property, to hold their investment. So there is all sorts of reasons that we are um, actually noticing. However, it doesn't take away the responsibility um, to comply. Hashtag your tax matters. So I will take this opportunity now to introduce our next two uh, presenters. So the following presenter is going to be um, uh, coming from two um, specialists that we have in South. Um, the first person to present to us is going to be Michael Kras Kraski. He is a chartered accountant with more than 30 years of experience in trust. Michael worked most of his career in South in the investigative audit area, where he has assisted auditors in trust-related cases. Michael is also responsible for training of SARS employee on trust through the SARS Institute of Learning. He's currently in the trust segment that assists the trust product owner with strategy and lies in, in all trust-related matters. And our second presenter from them it's going to be um, Nozuko Nita. Nozuko is a specialist responsible for the design of the trust system and processes at SARS. These include policies, standard operating procedures, and the related practices from registration to district resolution. Previously, she was a compliance risk specialist. Then from there, she became a risk manager at the large business and international division. Some of us, we all know it as LBC. She holds a master's in, in South Africa and in, in South Africa and international tax. So these two people are going to present to us the food of the day. So the things that we want to know, the things that we need clarity. So I will take this opportunity now to hand over to Mark, to Michael, and immediately after Michael, Nozuko is going to do the final part of the presentation. Michael. Thank you, Mr. Program Director. Um, just give me a second to put my uh, presentation on. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, Mr. Program Director, for that introduction. Um, sorry, let me just do that. There we are. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to share with you some knowledge on trusts and uh, predominantly Income Tax Act, but I will also be referring to the Trust Property Control Act uh, during my presentation. In fact, I will start off with that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to indicate to you that uh, this uh, webinar does come with a disclaimer uh, that uh, and um, my colleague Muzi later will indicate a, a little bit more about this uh, disclaimer. So trust in South Africa, uh, Mark mentioned the roots of trust, and I'm just going to take you through uh, the the presentation as as we are going to do it this evening. 
Um, if you address your questions, and, and uh, remember that there's two platforms in which you, you may address questions for those on Zoom, you can forward uh, questions through Zoom chat, uh, and Muzi will then attend to those. And alternatively, you can send uh, questions to the mailbox at questions at sars.gov.za. So we're going to be going through uh, the background and uh, the, the need for uh, registration. I'm just going to highlight that for you. Then we are going to talk uh, about some relevant uh, definitions. I'll be chatting about the income and expenditure of trusts, uh, the vesting of income and capital gains as it is in the Income Tax Act. Then we will be talking about non-resident trusts. I'm just going to highlight a few points there. Um, then specific application trusts, uh, like for instance, uh, non-profit trusts, etc. We're going to look at those. Anti-avoidance legislation, um, and uh, specifically focusing on Section 7 Cap C, for those that are interested in that. And then my colleague um, Nozuku will be taking you through some of the uh, legislative changes that might be applicable to you in this year. And then finally, just a few tips from Nozuku as well. So ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, as Mark mentioned, uh, trusts uh, uh, came from English law many years ago. Nonetheless, they were introduced into South Africa in the 1800s, early 1800s, and they have evolved over the years uh, through predominantly case law. We have uh, the only legislation that applies to trusts in South Africa currently um, that we are concerned with is the Trust Property Control Act that is um, in essence a codification of certain of the rules around trusts, but case law predominantly um, uh, uh, evolved to give us the trust and the trust applications as we have it today. Some of those uh, principles still remain even though we have uh, introduced tax legislation in this regard. However, I need to take your, uh, focus your attention on three sections within the Trust Property Control Act just as a start off. So specifically for those people on the webinar this evening that are trustees, please uh, avail, make sure that you, are, um, uh, that you know uh, what the sections in the Trust Property Control Act entail. You need to print it out. It's a very short act and uh, read through it because you are responsible as a trustee. And in that regard, um, section nine of the Trust Property Control Act requires of a trustee to act with care, diligence, and the skill required of a trustee to act uh, in his fiduciary capacity as a trustee. Um, just be aware of the fact that uh, this is a requirement in terms of legislation, that you act with care, diligence, and uh, with the necessary skill. Now, if you are not in a position to act with the, with, uh, with the, the necessary skill, you might be in the position where you appoint, for instance, a tax practitioner to complete the returns or to help you with the financial statements uh, for I trust, and, and I would uh, care to say that that would mean you comply with the requirements of Section 9. Then uh, a little known fact is that uh, in terms of Section 10 uh, of the Trust Property Control Act, when the trustees take any money uh, into their control, they are required by the Act to open up a banking account with a banking institution. It is a requirement in terms of Section 10. So if you were not aware of that, again, go and read the Act. Then finally, I'd just like to, uh, the, the final section that I'd like to highlight is Section 11. Um, and I'd just like to indicate there that uh, where assets of a trust are held by a trustee in a fiduciary capacity, they are required um, to, in terms of the registration, of these assets to make sure that it is identif identifiable as those of the trust. So in this regard, for instance, as an example, when a bank account is opened up and it is uh, for the, the uh, trust, um, the, the trustees will open up that banking account, but it is important that the bank account should indicate that that trust is held for and on behalf of the trust. And then similarly for 
all other assets should be clearly uh, marked or clearly identifiable as those of the trust. In this regard, I would also like to highlight, and uh, my colleague uh, Nozuko will chat a little bit more about this a little bit later, but in terms of crypto assets that are uh, under the management or control or ownership of, a, uh, of the trustees of a trust, those crypto assets needs to be recorded in the financial statements of the said trust and uh, should there be any realized uh, crypto profits made then um, they must be reflected in uh, also in the financial statements and obviously then also be included in your tax return so uh, be aware of of that fact all right, though, then um, just in terms of a uh, few different types of trust that we, uh, that we find in South Africa, there's a, a, a misunderstanding in terms of the types of trust, but they are not um, exclusively one or the other, and they may actually vary, uh, and they may have but more than one identity. So I'm just gonna highlight one or two of them. In terms of the Trust Property Control Act, we have two types of trust being the ownership trust and the Bevin trust. The difference between these two trusts are in essence who holds the assets. In the case of a Bevin trust, the assets are held by the beneficiaries but are managed on their behalf by trustees. In the second case, the trustees hold the assets in their fiduciary capacity uh, for the trust and uh, the, the beneficiaries of the trust will um, only acquire a right to them once uh, they are vested into the hands of those beneficiaries. So those are the two types of trust in terms of the TPCA. Then uh, two other types of trust um, that, that are very pertinent and that we in the income tax do make a differentiation on are the two types of trust known as a vested trust or a contingent trust and then Obviously, there will also be a hybrid of the two, as I will indicate shortly. So the difference between the two types of trusts is that a, a trust that is a vested trust in the uh, trust instrument, which Mark indicated earlier, the trust instrument being either a will in the case of a will trust or a testamentary trust, as it is known, or the trust deed in the case of an inter vivos trust, um, that trust instrument will indicate the, that the individual, the beneficiary, will, will have the right to uh, a, a certain asset or a certain stream of income, whatever the case may be. So it is a vested right in terms of the trust instrument. Then um, the second type is a discretionary right. Now, strangely enough, the trustees are provided with a discretionary right in terms of the trust instrument and they uh, would be afforded the right to decide on when these uh, assets of the trust or the income of the trust may be vested into beneficiaries. This is known as a discretionary or contingent trust. Now, obviously, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have, may have hybrids of these because you might find in one trust that you have both of these rights in the trust. I'm not gonna elaborate on that too much, um, yes. Then in terms of the Income Tax Act, I would like to highlight one specific trust that is uh, very specific to the Income Tax Act, and that is uh, the special trust. Now, please take note that for uh, there is qualifying criteria for a special trust. It is defined in the section one of the Income Tax Act, but in essence, you do get two types of uh, special trust. The first being a special trust for uh, the benefit of persons with a mental or physical disability. And then secondly, for relations in, uh, or for family members, relations in relation to a deceased person um, and uh, with the youngest uh, of the family members not being older than 18 years. Those are in the definitions and uh, those uh, qualifying disabilities are in section six of the Income Tax Act. You can go and read up on that if this is uh, applicable to you. Also bear in mind that there are special rates of taxation for special trusts, and they are taxed at a sliding scale that mirrors those of the uh, individuals or natural persons. 
And uh, uh, in addition, just re also remember that they do not qualify for rebates. The special trust does not qualify for rebates. So um, in terms of, of tax planning, just for those trustees there, if you are the trustee for somebody with a mental or physical disability, for instance, and you would like to apply for the medical uh, credits, then make sure that an amount is vested into the hands of the beneficiary, being that uh, mental or physical disabled person, and then they can claim that uh, Section 6 medical credits, which is not allowed to be deducted in a special trust. All right, let's continue. Um, ladies and gentlemen, just a, a few relevant definitions. Now, these are all in the Income Tax Act. I'm just going to highlight uh, one or two parts of these sections. As Mark indicated, um, the definition of a person includes a trust, uh, amongst others. Deceased estates and a few others also are included there, but it excludes a CIS or a Collective Investment Scheme Trust. However, the, uh, the importance of the fact that that uh, trust is included in the definition uh, is that all of the sections of the income tax will then apply to trusts as well as they acquire a semi-legal or a quasi-legal persona for tax purposes. And uh, 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 trust is then a taxpayer uh, in its full right with uh, the trustees uh, being the representative taxpayer of the trust. Then just in terms of a trust, the one identified in the Income Tax Act relates to the trust in a narrow sense where that means that the persons responsible for the trust, the trustees um, hold an office and they have fiduciary duties uh, to ensure that the affairs of the trusts are run in the way that it should. That, that is uh, the difference between this trust and, and different other types of trusts. Then in terms of beneficiaries, uh, ladies and gentlemen, be aware that uh, both types of beneficiaries are included in the definition. That would be beneficiaries who acquire a vested right or have a vested right, and those that are discretionary. So discretionary uh, beneficiaries would also be included. So when you read the Act, be aware of the fact that certain sections where references are made to beneficiaries, that it would include both of those types of beneficiaries. This becomes important when we uh, look at Section 25. Uh, cap B shortly. Then a connected person. Um, this is a is a, a quite a difficult definition to go and read and understand. Um, if you are a trustee and you're uncertain, uh, please speak to your legal practitioner or in our case we hope that you make use of a tax practitioner that can assist you uh, with your tax affairs. In essence, what a connected person definition for a trust entails is that a beneficiary of a trust is deemed to be a connected person in relation to that trust. But in addition to that, um, these beneficiaries, even though they may not be related, uh, would be connected persons in relation to each other in relation to the trust. So all beneficiaries of uh, the same trust are connected persons in relation to that trust. In addition, uh, please take note that uh, beneficiaries that anybody, any person uh, within the third degree of consanguinity who is a relative of that beneficiary would be a related person in relation to the trust. Now, this is significant and uh, specifically when we look at the considerations, for instance, uh, Section 7 Cap C of the Income Tax Act, where uh, the, the connected person definition plays a role in determining those loans that are made to uh, trusts. We will uh, talk about that in a short while. Then finally on the slide, I've uh, just decided to indicate residency status of a trust, if there's any issues around that. If a trust was formed in the Republic of South Africa, then it would be deemed to be a, a South African resident for tax purposes. However, if a trust is effectively managed in the Republic of South Africa, it would also be seen to be a tax resident for tax purposes in South Africa. So be aware of that second one. Right, then when we get to the nitty gritty um, income, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the income uh, of a 
trust would be treated the same way as, as most other taxpayers would be treated. So the normal rules in terms of income tax would apply to income. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. So you will uh, use your gross income definition and everything that goes uh, with that. Then in terms of expenditure, um, the same normal income tax rules also apply to expenditure. So your section 11 to section 19 uh, uh, inclusions in the Income Tax Act would apply. And then you will consider section 23 uh, as well in terms of, uh, of, of uh, the, your expenditure in your trust. Okay, so why is it important to consider section 23 uh, if? I have decided to highlight this to you, especially for those trustees or uh, practitioners out there that are not aware of the fact that you may have to apportion your income uh, or apportion your expenditure based on your uh, in, uh, streams of flow of income and uh, based on uh, exempt income. Now, if we look at section 23F of the Income Tax Act, it specifically precludes you from making deductions on exempt income items. So if you, for instance, have a dividend income, you will not be allowed to uh, deduct expenditure or, uh, in, in that regard, as the, uh, this is prohibited in terms of Section 23F. So I've decided to explain the apportionment a little bit better with a very, very simple example, uh, very basic. So uh, if your income is dividends of 10 Rand and you have rental income to the value of 10 Rand, your total would then be 20 Rand. This means that 50% of your uh, income would be uh, uh, exempt income. And in other words, this would kick in uh, section 23F on your expenditure. And the other 50% would be rental income. In this regard, if your expenditure now relates to six Rand, and it is uh, uh, in indirect expenses, which I'll explain shortly, then uh, we will uh, use a, an apportionment base and we'll say 50% of the expenses will be allowed and the other 50% will not be allowed as a deduction for tax purposes. What you do in the income statement for accounting purposes is, is different, but for tax purposes, the three rand uh, will lead to a, a permanent difference in terms of your uh, tax calculation. So uh, the, the net result of this is that you know, when you earn the 20 rand, uh, you will be exempt in terms of the dividends. So you'll only pay tax on the 10 rand, less, which is normal practice by a lot of uh, individuals who, uh, who prepare returns for trust, would be to deduct the full six rand. That is not allowed. You have to uh, apportion your expenses and only claim the portion of the expenses that does not uh, fall within the uh, Section 23 uh, F ambit. In this regard, I also need to indicate that Section 23 Q relates to foreign dividends. So if you should earn foreign dividends, then Section 23 Q does not allow any expenditure against uh, the amount of income earned in terms of foreign dividends. So for example, if you've earned 20 Rand of foreign dividends, you've uh, had expenditure to the value of six Rand to earn that, uh, that 20 Rand of foreign dividends, none of the six Rand will be allowable as a deduction, but uh, you have to declare the full uh, 20 uh, Rand of income. Okay. Then um, when we get to direct and indirect expenses, as I um, it alluded to, direct, expendi direct expenses in the relation to a trust is where there is a stream of income and that expense, like for instance, rental uh, expenditure, um, relate directly to the stream of income. So if your trust um, will, ha will have three or four different uh, types of uh, st or streams of income, your direct expenses would be that directly relate to the specific stream of income. In this case, rental income, you will have uh, rental expenses directly related to that. Opposing that is indirect uh, expenses. So in the case where you have expenditure, for instance, trustee fees, 
accounting fees, etc., office expenditure. There's a, there's a lot of those that you cannot directly link uh, directly to a stream of income. Then you will have to uh, allocate that under the heading of indirect expenses, and that will be apportioned in relation to the the different income streams. For example, in my previous example. Um, then 10% 10 of the expenses will then, uh, or 50% of the expenses will then go to uh, the rental income and 50% to the dividend income, or it will be expenditure falling under that stream. Okay, and that is important, as I mentioned, because that portion of the expenditure will not be allowable as a deduction. Right, then if we get to uh, the uh, trust specific. Uh, section being section 25 cap B. We have in essence three rules in section 25 cap B. The first one being the deemed income rule, section 25 cap B1. Now the deemed income rule relates directly to those rights that I previously mentioned. So where you have a vested right as a beneficiary to the income of a trust, then uh, that income will be ignored in the, in the trust and you will be taxed on that amount. That is the deemed income rule. An example of that is where the trust instrument determines that Mr. X has a right to 1,000 Rand per month from the trust. The end of the 12 month period, Mr. X would have uh, received uh, 12,000 Rand and Mr. X will then declare this in his return. Uh, as, uh, as earnings from the trust, and the trust will then be in a position where they may make a deduction in, in that regard from their taxable income. So the tax, the trust will not be taxed on that, but the individual will be taxed on that. And ladies and gentlemen, in this regard, may I please uh, remind you, specifically tax practitioners, make sure that where there, there are uh, amounts that are vested into beneficiaries, that those beneficiaries actually declare those amounts in their returns. Um, we have noted from uh, submissions that uh, the trusts show the uh, expenditure or the vested amounts, but it is not reflected in those individuals' returns. And as you know, that might uh, trigger an audit on that individual, which may be totally unnecessary. Then uh, secondly, the discretionary income rule, section 25, Cap B2, um, that one is the caters for the second scenario where uh, the trustees use their discretionary right to vest an amount in uh, to beneficiaries. So for instance, uh, just prior to year end, the trustees decide to vest 15,000 Rand to Mr. X. Then Mr. X will be responsible for the payment of the tax on the 15,000 Rand and the trust will not pay tax on it, it will be an, an allowable deduction in the trust. I maybe just need to mention that uh, section 25 uh, cap B1, the previous section that I discussed, also caters for the scenario where uh, an amount is not vested, should, should amounts not be vested, then it will be taxed in the trust, provided that uh, the discretionary income rule does not apply. Okay, so then we get to the third rule being the, the deemed uh, expenditure rule in terms of section 25 uh, cap B3. Um, what this section in essence says is that expenditure fishery, then the expenditure related to that stream of income will or must follow that uh, must follow that income. So the example I used below uh, is the one where uh, ten thousand rand was vested to Mr X being a rental income, um, but uh, then there was an amount of four thousand rand being expenditure related to the expenditure, and uh, that four thousand will then follow the ten thousand, which means Mr X will now be taxable on 6,000 Rand. However, also bear in mind that in the trust, both of these streams uh, will, be, uh, will be catered for. So uh, a deduction uh, will be allowed in terms of the uh, income. And similarly, 
you will uh, you will be allowed the expenditure to rectify that in your books as well. So the net effect is that uh, of the trust's uh, bottom line, uh, 6,000 Rand would have uh, been shown as flowing out of the trust and that the, it would not be uh, taxed on. Then, um, finally, in section 25, uh, cap B, I need to highlight cap B, 4, 5, and 6, um, limitation of losses. Ladies and gentlemen, be aware of this section. In my example here, for instance, if an amount of rental is vested into a specific beneficiary and the expenditure that goes with that line item, in other words, with that expenses, well, with, with the income, the expenses follows the income, then the expenses may not be more than the income. Um, and that is in terms of section 25 cap B4. What this means is that in my example, if 10,000 rent, uh, rental income was vested to the beneficiary and the expenditure was 12,000 rand, then Mr. X is only allowed, will only be allowed to use 10,000 rand of expenses and with a net effect of zero in his tax return. The, the uh, remaining 2,000 rand may be offset against other income of the trust in terms of section 25 uh, cap B uh, 5. And then failing that, or if there's an amount remaining, then that may be utilized by the beneficiary in the following year of assessment against other uh, against income from the trust. It's a very uh, technical area, this. If you are uncertain about this, please consult your tax practitioner to assist you in this regard. We will, uh, following this webinar and having received uh, some questions, we will be uh, updating our frequently asked questions and we will uh, then uh, provide clarity on, hopefully clarity on some of these issues. So be aware of the fact that we will uh, uh, give some examples of these uh, should those questions arise. Then in terms of capital gains, uh, again, the normal capital gains rules will apply uh, in terms of the H schedule, bearing in mind that in terms of section 26 cap A, the capital gain will then be included in uh, the, the calculation of your uh, net tax. Okay, so the usual um, disposal paragraph that we use is paragraph 111A, which uh, refers to uh, predominantly a uh, sale uh, made of an asset uh, and uh, the related uh, types of disposals. However, for a trust, we have an additional one. It's catered for in this, in this uh, paragraph, paragraph 111D, would be in the case where an asset is vested to a beneficiary. Now, how would this work? Um, this would mean that, for instance, if a, if a trust uh, owns a block of flats, and uh, in discussions with the beneficiaries or between the trustees, they decide, as opposed to selling the block of flats, they will vest the block of flats to that specific beneficiary. Then it will also be deemed to be a disposal if that asset is then uh, vested uh, and transferred to that beneficiary. And that uh, would then be in terms of uh, paragraph 111D. Okay, so to cater for those two different scenarios, we have two paragraphs being paragraph 81 and 82 of the uh, eighth schedule that deals with uh, the, uh, with the uh, uh, attribution of capital gains to uh, beneficiaries. So in the case of paragraph 81, um, it deals with the attribution of, or the scenario that is created with uh, paragraph 111D disposal, where an asset is vested into or to a beneficiary. In that case, paragraph 81 then, uh, in, then says that if an uh, asset is uh, in a specific year of uh, assessment is vested to a beneficiary, then the beneficiary will include the aggregate capital gain or aggregate capital loss in their return or in their tax affairs, and the trust will ignore the capital gain in its uh, calculation of its aggregate capital gain or cap capital loss. Then uh, paragraph 82 caters for the, for the other scenario, and that is where the trust uh, decides to sell an asset in a year of assessment. So if the trust sells this asset, 
and they realize a capital gain, then they are allowed to vest the capital gain to a beneficiary or beneficiaries. And then in terms of paragraph 82, um, the uh, individual would have to, or the uh, beneficiary would then have to include the capital gain into their aggregate capital gain or loss, and the trust will then ignore it in their aggregate capital gain or loss. Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, then just be aware if the attribution does not occur, in other words, if there's no vesting, then the amount would be taxable in the trust itself. Okay, um, then special trusts, finally, um, capital gains in a special trust, we have uh, a few uh, uh, rebates uh, that uh, special trust qualify for. I'm not going to go into too much detail. If you are a trustee or a tax practitioner for a special trust, then uh, please take note that uh, there is certain rebates that, uh, that uh, trusts qualify uh, when they are classified as a special trust. In that regard, just also take note that a special trust um, would have to go through an initial uh, registration process. So like all other trusts, it is a requirement for a trust to register with SARS. Once you have registered uh, with SARS, then you can apply to become a special trust, and that can be done at a branch. Okay. Then um, have an interesting se section, uh, ladies and gentlemen, being uh, that of non-resident trusts, and this is catered for in both income tax and capital gains tax, um, amounts that are received by a South African resident from a non-resident trust, in terms of section 25 cap B in brackets 2 cap A, the following uh, would apply. So if a resident taxpayer receives an amount from a non-resident trust, and in the period to which uh, this amount relate, if it was a, 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 a retained amount in that trust, and the person who receives uh, the amount, the beneficiary, was a discretionary beneficiary in that trust. The amount had not yet been taxed in South Africa, but the amount would have been taxed in South Africa had it been a South African resident trust, then that amount should be included in the taxable income of the resident beneficiary in the year of assessment in which the amount is received. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it is a mouthful. Please uh, refer to the Income Tax Act. Um, I think the Tax Act uh, explains it better than I do. It's straightforward and uh, easy to understand when you when you read it in the Income Tax Act. Just be aware of that. Okay. So uh, just also, if you're a tax practitioner and uh, your taxpayer on whose behalf you act uh, receives amount from a, amounts from a non-resident trust. Just be sure to test these, this income and make sure uh, that it does not uh, fall within this bracket, which means you should include it. All right, then secondly, there was a further amendment, uh, section 25 cap B to cap B, um, based on the uh, Panama Papers, there was certain uh, tax uh, schemes identified. And following this, the act was amended. And uh, in essence, what this section will do is that it will enhance the scope of the previous sections that I section that I just mentioned. And it would uh, include further amounts uh, in terms of uh, this uh, section 25 cap B 2A that you would have to declare in your return. Okay, so please, that is a very technical area and you might have to consult a tax practitioner to assist you with that. Right, then in terms of capital gains, um, uh, amounts received by South African residents, similar to the, the definition in section 25 cap B, 2 cap A, we have paragraph 80 in brackets three, that uh, in essence uh, do the same for, uh, for capital gains tax, what section 25 cap B, 2 cap A does for income tax. So if an amount is received and it is of a capital nature and all of those other qualifying criteria are met, 
then uh, you will have to include that capital gain in your aggregate capital gain for the year. Okay, then special uh, types of trust, special applications. The first one I want to highlight is a personal services provider or previously known as the personal services trust or company. The fourth schedule was amended and it now refers to a personal services provider. In essence, ladies and gentlemen, um, if, you, if, you, uh, op, if your affairs are run through a trust and there are certain qualification criteria in terms of the fourth schedule, then you may have to, uh, they, or then you may qualify as a personal services provider, which means that if you are uh, uh, classified as a PSP, in essence, uh, you will uh, then be required or the person who pays the amount of income to you on a periodic basis, whether it's monthly or otherwise, would then be required to deduct, uh, would then be required to uh, deduct pay as you earn off that amount on, uh, on um, the amount that you earn on a monthly basis. And in addition to that, the expenditure that you will be allowed at the end of the year when you prepare your tax return, the expenditure will be limited in terms of Section 23K of the Income Tax Act. So uh, it is uh, quite onerous, the, the um, amounts that are uh, allowed to be deducted. So uh, make sure that you do not uh, fall within that classification of a personal services provider. If you do, please speak to your tax practitioner. Then um, in terms of uh, other application trusts, we have a public benefit organizations trust or PBO trusts. Um, I have uh, referred you to the relevant sections in uh, the act here. Please be aware of the fact that if you uh, want to qualify as a public benefit organization trust, then you have to register as a tax payer prior to applying to the tax exempt institutions unit in SARS to provide you with the classification as a PBO trust. We are aware that there, uh, is a, that there are a lot of uh, strange happenings in some of these trusts, and we are focusing a little bit uh, more attention on these PBO trusts currently. Also, take note that failure to submit uh, your return on an annual basis uh, could mean that you would lose your classification as a PBO entity. Also take note, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, PBO trusts, uh, in terms of the sections mentioned, their income might be deemed to be exempt, and uh, thus they will not pay tax on those amounts. In addition, also uh, take note that not all PBO entities um, are allowed to issue a Section 18 Cap A certificate. There is uh, specific categories of uh, trust uh, of uh, PBOs that may issue these. So also again, make sure that you uh, qualify prior to issuing a uh, Section 18 Cap A certificate. All right, then other types of trusts. I've just highlighted them. Uh, collective Investment Scheme Trusts, um, Section 25 Cap B Cap A provides for an extended period for uh, the amounts to be vested to beneficiaries prior to uh, the trust having to pay tax on those amounts received. Land Rehabilitation Trusts uh, brings environmental affairs closer to tax law. Um, read up Section 37 Cap A, but it's also a very specific uh, section of the Act. Then BEE uh, and other uh, types of share incentive scheme trusts, etc. There's a lot of applications for trust due to the versatility of the trust as a, as a, a, a vehicle. Um, so there might be various different other applications, which we're not going to deal with today. Then um, anti-avoidance measures. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, start off with section 7 cap C. Please uh, be aware of the section when it was it reduced, as I mentioned earlier, as it was when it was introduced on the 1st of March in 2017, uh, uh, caused quite an outcry from tax practitioners and, uh, and uh, taxpayers the like, but I think uh, the dust has settled on this one. So in essence, what uh, Section 7 Cap C will do, 
this section um, requires that donations tax is levied on low interest or no interest loans made uh, by uh, connected persons in relation to a trust to that trust. So if they if there are loans sitting in your trust that uh, comply or that fall within the ambit of Section 7C, uh, an affected loan, then you might have to ask your tax practitioner to indicate to you what the effect of Section 7 Cap C is. You will have to calculate donations, uh, donations tax on the, um, on the amount of interest that was foregone due to the fact that this uh, uh, loan is made at low or no interest rates. Then section 7C has been with us for uh, a long time. Uh, we all know uh, most of the inclusions in terms of uh, section 7C. Be aware of the fact for section 7C to apply, there must be a donation settlement or other similar disposition. Um, and that is uh, something that you can read up on section seven. In, in a trust environment, this would be applicable because there are donations made to trusts, and this would mean that Section 7 could apply. If you're unsure about Section 7, we don't have enough time to go through, through all of the subsections tonight, but please go and read up on, on Section 7. Then um, I would like to highlight Section 1031, which relates to the trafficking in assessed losses or uh, assessed capital losses. Ladies and gentlemen, be aware of the fact that this is not permitted. Uh, if you, you should trade in assessed losses, and this could happen, although it's against the spirit of a trust, but if you would uh, sell a trust to uh, another and another would use this uh, assessed loss or assessed capital loss in that trust uh, to avoid paying uh, taxes, then um, that uh, amount of the assessed loss might be ignored by uh, the commissioner. Be aware of uh, the fact that the onus of proof lies on the uh, trust, on the taxpayer, and not on SARS in this regard. Then uh, paragraph 68 and paragraph up to paragraph 72, in uh, essence, mirrors section 7 of the Income Tax Act, but it relates to capital gains. I'm not going to discuss that in more detail. Just be aware of it. Uh, donation settlement or other similar disposition and uh, capital gains in that regard might fall foul of paragraph 68 to 72. All right, so um, that is my part of uh, the discussion uh, this uh, afternoon. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague uh, Nozuku Nkita, and she's going to take you through the legislative changes and through some of the top tips. Thank you, Nozuku. Thank you, Michael. Um, as Michael has mentioned, I'll be taking you through the new, some of the new legislative changes relating to trust and our top tips um, for this filing season. I just wanna point out that one of our, our strategic intent as an organization is to promote voluntary co compliance so by coming to you in this, in this platform, we hope to stay up that kind of culture in the trust segment. Starting off with our first change that we're going to be talking about this evening is cryptocurrency. And the definition of financial instrument in section one of the Income Tax Act, cryptocurrency has been amended to crypto asset. The impact of this change on your tax return, which is ITR 12T, will be on the change of field names and source codes. The next change we will be relates to sunset dates, which are for corporate tax incentives. I won't go through all of these sections because of time, uh, but what this basically means is that there's a specific date uh, that has been stipulated for the discontinuation of these allowances. So the e in your tax return and also in your, in your tax return, there's an additional question that has been added for validation to accommodate these sunset dates, meaning if an asset has been brought into use or on or before the 28th of February, 2022, it, it will be allowed to be claimed, but after that date, you won't be able to, uh, to claim this allowance. As I mentioned earlier, I won't go through all the sections because the change is the same, except for section 13 quarts, 
where it applies to the allowance will be applicable to assets brought into use after 31st March 2022. Then the next change that we're going to deal with is relates to lump sum benefits. A new uh, paragraph, paragraph 3B in the second schedule of the Income Tax Act has been introduced. This paragraph 3B, it relates to lump sum benefits which become recoverable from pension fund, pension Pro preservation fund, provident fund, provident preservation fund, if the lump sum is payable in consequence of termination of a trust. And therefore, the income from that will be deemed to be, to, to have accrued to the trust immediately prior to the date of termination. The impact with regards to this change is now that the trust can now apply for a tax directive for a fuel commu commu commutation of the remaining of the living annuity on termination of the trust. Due to this reason, a new income container was added onto the return for the declaration of this lump sum. The lump sum will be taxed in accordance to the retirement fund lump sum benefit rates. Section 25 uh, cap B subsection one has been amended accordingly to, to include this section, section 3B, which basically means that um, the income that has been received by the trust, this lump sum, cannot be distributed or vested. Now coming to our top tips for this uh, filing season, we, in our endeavor to make it easier for taxpayers to comply. We have come up, we've provided you with these top tips. These are matters that were raised by taxpayers. The first one relates to inception date for loans on the schedule of transactions with beneficiaries and trustees. We have noted that this question comes up every year where the taxpayers are not sure which date to use there, probably because of the, the loan would have increased or decreased throughout the year. So the correct date there to be used will be your original date of the loan. You can also consult or visit our webpage where you'll find the guides that will guide you relating on how to complete your tax return and also how to register on e-filing and other matters. The next item will relate to the release of a return with these new legislative changes. The release is on the 1st of September. However, I would like to point out that you can still file now your return as this change, which probably is section 3B, will, will be, have an impact in the following year, in the, in the next financial year. Coming to future developments with regards to online registration, we have received um, comments from taxpayers uh, asking why or trust they still have to manually register or go to the branches, the branches to register for tax. We'd like to point out that this is a, of high importance to us. This is a high priority. We are currently busy with an initiative which will enable the, the registration of trust online using our SAS online query system. This system is, a, is currently being used for PIT and other taxes. So taking into account the devastation of, of the pandemic, we, we, we plan to expedite this, this matter so that we can reduce the face-to-face -face interactions and, and possibly limit the spread of the virus. So I would like to encourage you again to keep your comments coming for, so that we can make that section of our top tips excite, more exciting in the coming years. If you will, to make it easy for you to, uh, to contact us, you can go digital and download the SAS Mob, Mobi app via your app store, register for e-filing here. Um, if you need a tax number, register for e-filing and you'll be automatically registered for personal income tax and receive a tax reference number. Hashtag your tax matters. Over to you, Program Director. Wow, 
Wow, wow, wow. Thank you very much for unpacking the trust, um, Michael and Nozuko. You have given us the food of the day. And uh, I can see already in our Q&A already, the questions are coming fast. And uh, now we are coming into an item where we'll try to deal with some of them. Obviously, we are considerate of time. And uh, just a reminder to say those that are in the Zoom space, you can use our Q&A um, Zoom chat to um, send your questions. But those that are, 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 are live streaming from the YouTube channel, please send us an email as Michael has announced to questions at sars.gov.za, questions at sars.gov.za. Um, so please send all your emails in there. Um, now, um, the following a presenter, which is um, uh, it's Mr. Um, Muzi Nkize, who's going to coordinate and try to deal with some of the questions that you've put in our in our email address for those that are in the, uh, those are in the, in the YouTube and also those that are in our, in our Zoom uh, chat that uh, we are going to try to address. So, Muzi Nkize is a qualified chair accountant working in a high net worth individual unit as a senior specialist audit. His current role involves providing audits, uh, direction, and guidance to the auditors in investigating tax awareness schemes. He has over 20 years of working experience, of which 10 years have been spent at SARS in the investigative body and legal support. He's going to coordinate and try to attend to some of your questions, and he has got a panel that is going to assist him to do that. Mr. Mkiz. Uh, thank you, Programs Director. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for attending, and I wish you are still enjoying uh, the session so far. Uh, without further ado, we only have a very limited time available for us to uh, do all the questions. And there's quite a lot of questions that have come in. We'll try and answer some of the questions uh, privately, as we have been doing, and some questions, we'll answer them outside of this meeting. Uh, together with me in the panel who's going to be assisting with answering the questions is Michael Kraski, uh, who presented uh, the topic uh, on trust. Uh, he will be joined by Dries van Niekerk, a specialist from legal counsel uh, in the, uh, within the SARS department of, uh, which deals with legal matters. And then there'll be Anna Marie Bukes uh, from business, business design and engineering. Uh, is a specialist in that unit. He's re she's responsible for the alignment of SARS forms, uh, the systems and procedures together with the law. And then there's also Cameroon Peter Se, who's a specialist within digital channels. Uh, he looks after all the digital uh, issues, uh, such as e-filing and, and so forth. So together with me, they will be assisting with answering questions. As I said, there's quite a lot of questions that are there, but I also just want to also advise you that um, the answers that are going to be given here cannot be seen as a, an advice or as an opinion, neither they are binding on SARS. Uh, this is just to assist, provide some clarity on certain issues and some certainty as well. But uh, once again, if you require detailed uh, answers and responses, uh, you will probably need to follow the other channels that are there and engage the consultants as necessary. Uh, without further ado, uh, there is one question that I'm going to pose to Michael. Uh, and then there'll be another one that I'll post to Trace, and they can just answer in that order, as well as uh, to you, Anna Marie, for now. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I noticed is that there's a lot of questions that have to do with registration. So those questions on registrations, they seem to be general. There is a uh, guidance on the internet as to how one goes about um, registering a trust. We have seen quite a lot of those. So those will not be able to deal with all of those uh, tonight. Uh, a question to you, Michael. It relates to your presentation um, on the apportionment of income, uh, and sorry, of expenses uh, the, uh, when it comes to a trust. Uh, you made an example that if there's exempt dividends, the income needs to be apportioned. Uh, the question that came is, does SARS have a formula or a practice of how to apportion uh, the expense that relates to dividends? And if you do apportion in relation to dividends, do you do that uh, excluding dividends withholding tax, or you also take into account uh, dividends withholding tax? And the question to you, um, 
Dries has to do with a non-resident trust. Uh, the participant has asked whether the non-resident trust needs to register for tax in South Africa if they are only earning uh, interest income that is exempt in terms of 101H uh, or whether they don't need to register. Uh, if you probably don't have an answer to that, uh, you can throw the question back to me. And then to you, um, Anna Marie, uh, if you can assist, we know that section 12J uh, sunset clause has come in on the uh, 30th of June. Uh, will you be amending the return uh, to take away that deduction? or it will still be there because the benefit of the 12J will still apply to the person. It's just the deduction that is not gonna be available. If you can please answer in that order, uh, I'd greatly appreciate then we'll take another set of questions. Over to you, Michael. Thank you, Muzi. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the short answer to that is that uh, we have noted the, the question um, and I have, as I've indicated, uh, on, uh, we will address this in our frequently asked questions uh, on the website. So I will provide you uh, with an example under FAQs as to how it should be applied. Um, to get to your second uh, part of the question, the, the amount that uh, is used in the apportionment would be the net amount after the uh, payment of the dividends tax. So the amount that uh, comes into the trust itself will be the amount that uh, will be used uh, to do the calculation of the apportionment. Um, that was a very simple uh, example that I gave, but we will provide you with a, a little bit more uh, detailed uh, example in the FAQs. Thank you, Muzi. Thank you, Michael. May I ask uh, Tris to attend the question uh, regarding the registration of a non-resident trust, whether it, that's necessary. Tris, over to you. Uh, thank you, Musi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I must say that's a bit of a curveball. I'm not 100% sure. I think that the logic would be that you should register because how which SARS now that that income is indeed exempt in terms of 101H. So um, with the provisor that I'm uncertain, uh, I believe that you should register. But perhaps you can send me an email and then we can or send an email to the uh, email address that we've mentioned and then we can respond to that properly. Thank you, Tris. May I ask Anna Marie, over to you. Yeah. Um, yes, Musi, uh, um, we are aware of the Section 12J uh, change in the Act, and uh, it will be implemented with the next version of the return. There are a few issues we are still uh, discussing with legal, but most probably with the next version of them, this will also be implemented, yes. Thank you, Anna-Marie. Uh, I'm going to move to another set uh, in the interest of time. Uh, this one goes to uh, you, Michael, again, because you are the one who gave us an uh, interesting discussion on the trust. Uh, if you can answer it, please do so. If you can't, we'll then see how we deal with it. Uh, this has to do with your special B trust. Uh, the question that's been posed there is whether uh, if, if it's a road accident uh, trust, you know, is created because there is a road accident amount that needs to be paid. Uh, I presume that could be to a minor or to a person who's unable to look after their affairs. Uh, does that fall under inter vivos trust? Um, if you can answer that, if you can't, it seems like a very technical question. And then um, to you, Tris, again, uh, a quick one on the vesting of an amount um, by a trust. Uh, whether if the amount is not uh, vested uh, to a beneficiary by a trust in the same year and is vested the following year, will that amount be capital? Is that what capital is all about? Uh, can you just, the two of you, address those ones? Thank you. Okay, 
Okay, thank you for the question, uh, Muzi. Can you see me? Yes. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yes, thanks. Thanks uh, for the question. Um, I think uh, I will be in a position to answer both of, of those uh, questions, uh, Muzi. So in terms of uh, the question on a special trust, uh, the, if a payment is made from uh, a, a, a fund, like for instance, the one you mentioned, then um, it can either go to a inter vivos trust, which means a trust that was already um, set up, or in terms of the will of the deceased person, um, the trust by, may be set up, which means it would be a, a testamentary trust. So it could be uh, either. Um, the qualification uh, would then be uh, to apply to SARS uh, to qualify as a special trust uh, in, in terms of uh, the rules. So in, in, in terms of the uh, gross income definition, uh, you will uh, see if you comply with, uh, with that uh, qualification criteria. And if it uh, should be for a person uh, with a mental or physical disability, you'll have to go to section six of the Income Tax Act. Um, there you will see what the qualifi qualification criteria is uh, in relation uh, to the, the um, person with a mental or physical disability. Um, Muzi, just remind me of the other question, please. Uh, the other question had to do with an amount that is not vested by a trust in the same year of receipt. It's vested in the following year. Uh, whether that amount is what okay. we call capital in, yeah. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, if an amount has not been vested in the same year of assessment as it was earned by the trust, then it would uh, be post-tax money in the trust uh, because it would already have been taxed in the trust. For example, if you earn an amount of 100 uh, uh, in the trust in the 2020 year um, of assessment and you want to vest it in 2021 year, then it would already be taxed in the 2020 year of assessment in the trust and it would then be vested in the following year, but it would be in the form of capital, but not the capital as in capital assets, just in terms of retained amounts or retained earnings uh, in the trust, and it would not be subject to tax again. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Michael, for that. And as I said, we seem to have a lot of questions regarding uh, the registration of trust. Uh, I'm uh, known to refer and the participants to the website of SARS, you know, deal with those issues. But it is one regarding uh, the homeowners body it appears as if it starts a filing, which makes it important uh, for one. And uh, that question has also been posed by another colleague by the name of Jacques as well, who has raised the same concern with regards to the transfer of trust for the corporates and so on. It seems to be problematic because it shows the registration number as being invalid. Uh, I don't know whether you are able to provide a, a high level response to that. I can just maybe pause there for now, if you can just come to that point. Uh, sorry, Muzi, you were breaking up there for a second. Um, were you, did you pose the question to me? Muzi, you're muted. So that it is regarding the registration of homeowners associations, the body corporates, it appears as if the registration number seems to uh, on if I, uh, it, and this problem seems to be uh, experienced by another taxpayer there, Jacques also has raised it uh, to say that uh, you can't transfer a trust or incorporate a homeowner association POs between tax practitioners because of the registration number being in the lead. 
All right. So, okay, Muzi, uh, you broke up a bit there, but I did have a look at the question and um, I have responded to those two questions requesting additional details so we can take a look. But uh, we do see this error come up on e-filing sometimes when there is a difference in um, the registration details that uh, trusts or some of those other entity types attempt a registration on e-filing. So, uh, at first glance, I would suggest that the users double check that the registration info they're using when creating these taxpayers on e-filing match to what SARS has on record. Um, that, that's where, where I would start looking at, at those types of errors. But uh, like I mentioned, we have requested uh, some further details for those two questions, which we will provide feedback on. Thank you, Cameron, for that. Thank you very much. Um, I, I can just quickly move to another one uh, for you, Michael. Uh, the taxpayers always complain. Uh, I've, I've noted another comment like that to say if a beneficiary is not in the trust. Uh, SARS wants to take the distribution to that charity. Um, we seem to have lost uh, Muzi, uh, but I think I got the gist of uh, the question from Muzi. Uh, in essence, it seems like the question is, uh, if, Mu if uh, a person is not a beneficiary of a trust and the a distribution is made to that person, um, that, that SARS has a problem with that. I don't think that, uh, that it's only SARS that will have a problem with that. Uh, the bottom line is that if you are not a beneficiary of a trust, you will in essence not qualify for an amount to be vested or distributed to you. This is uh, in part the essence of, of a trust and the way that a, that a trust functions. Um, I wouldn't like to, to use uh, this example, but maybe it is a good one. You're not going to be earning dividends if you're not a shareholder. That's that's sort of uh, what you can uh, relate to. So um, also be aware of the fact that um, in terms of Section 56.1L of uh, the Income Tax Act, which uh, it deals with donations, um, the distributions to uh, beneficiaries uh, is exempt uh, from donations tax. So. If an asset, for instance, was uh, donated to a trust, there would be donations tax payable on that asset. If it is, is then invested to a, a beneficiary at a later stage, there is no further donations tax as uh, in the first instance, um, uh, section 56 uh, exempts it. And secondly, it would comply with either, uh, or it should comply rather with uh, paragraph 81 or 82. Thank you. Thank you very much for answering that last question, uh, Michael. And uh, unfortunately, we have had some technical issues with Musi was coordinating our question and, and, and answers. And um, we have come to an end of our session at right now. And I want to thank all our presenters. I want to thank um, all our panelists for their contribution. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all our members in, um, in our YouTube channel. Uh, those that have joined us via the, um, the Zoom channel also, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you very much to the members of XCOP South. Thank you, the commissioner. Thank you, all the staff that have joined us. Uh, I mean, SARS employees that have joined us from different uh, regions. And we have come to an end. Unfortunately, we had some technical issues at the end of towards the end of our question and answers. But however, I want to say that for all those questions that have been posted, 
uh, in our Q&A, those questions that have been posted in our, in our email uh, channel, we are going to attend to all of them and uh, we are going to provide feedback. But some of those questions that have been asked, especially regarding the registration, if you quickly visit our website, there is a guideline, there is an external guideline of how to register a trust. Um, there is an external guideline of how to change your banking details. There is also on our Q&A also answers that answers things like uh, questions around registration. I've seen one question around the, the VET, whether the trust can register for VET or not. If you go back into a Q&A, those answers have been provided in there. Um, firstly, is that it has to be an enterprise, of course. It has to meet all the requirements of, of an enterprise before it can register. And once the trust meets those requirements, it has to register, uh, for example. So <clears throat> a lot of your questions that have been asked, I can see that there is answers in our, in our external guide. So please visit our website, download that, um, read it, and use all our channels in terms of your, your questions. And we are going to attend to all of them. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Thank you very much for staying with us. Um, we do have a questionnaire now that we would like you guys to complete, give us feedback, because we still have got a lot of webinars that we're going to host. In actual fact, our next webinar that we're going to host will have to do with uh, um, the Solidarity Fund and donation stacks. And I think you might have noted that when Michael was presenting, he, he spoke about Section 7C uh, that deals with the donation and the donation stacks and the, the deemed donation implication in there. So I think that, that's, that, that webinar session will help unpack some of those issues in that particular session. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Please stay tuned into all our social media platform, our Facebook, our Twitter account. In actual fact, uh, this YouTube channel link is available in our, on, on, our, on our Facebook channel and our Twitter channel, and also in our SARS website. So if you want to listen to this, maybe you have missed some of the session, or you want to go back and listen again, I, I will ad I advise you to go back into our link. In our SARS website, there is a link to this. In our YouTube channel, SARS YouTube channel, there is a link to this. You can go back and, you know, and listen to this presentation and also in our Twitter channel. So, so with those, I want to say that, guys, please use our Facebook channel, use our SARS channel and uh, internet and, and website channel to engage us and to seek more clarity. We'll be there to engage with you. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. And um, I want to thank all the panelists and all the presenters um, that we had today. Thank you very much, guys. We've come to an end. And we've run over a little about four minutes. Um, but thank you very much for participating, joining us, and engaging with us. And we'll play a little bit of video that really wants to remind you that your text matters. Your text matters. Hashtag your text matters. Good night and bye bye. It matters now more than ever. It matters to those who are exposed to harm to keep us away from it. The ones that leave behind all that they love. Your tax matters to them. Those who spend endless hours standing on their feet to care for others. It matters to those who are always at the heart of any crisis and our future generations. It matters to those who put so much love into giving selflessly to each and every family living on the breadline. It matters to all of us. To all taxpayers, pay your fair share. Do it for your nation. Your tax matters.